Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Did you serve at Camp Lejeune between 1853 and 10 minutes ago? Do you have a structured settlement, but you need cash now? <laughs> Were you injured while watching the trip or listening to the fall? If you answered yes to any of these questions, fuck off. Because the law firm of Talcum, Clean, Stevens, and Anonymous doesn't deal with that sort of stuff. <laughs> we are, we're strictly interested in rock and roll lawsuits, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, everybody will be talking about their favorite rock and roll lawsuits, and you may you may choose up to three. And because I'm verbose, I've chosen three. So, gentlemen, are you ready for me to start with mine? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. My first one, and probably the reason why I went with this topic, is... Chubby Checker versus the Chubby Checker. Um, Chubby Checker, who, you know, best known for the twist, which is one of the first dances that white people can kind of do. Um, Chubby Checker uh, settled in 2013, I think it was, a lawsuit that he had against Hewlett Packard. And that was over a penis measuring app. So there was a, um, it turned out that he had asked for half a billion dollars in damage. And I think he, he should have definitely gotten that uh, from Hewlett Packard for irreparable damage and harm caused by the Chubby Checker. An app for the Hewlett Packard Palm OS, say Harry Palm joke in there, um, and uh, um, uh, their platform. So the Chubby Checker app, you would enter your shoe size. It took UK, US, and European shoe sizes, and then it would return your penis measurement. So, you know, the whole like, you know, big feet. Big shoes, yeah, that, that's where that came from. Um, some estimates, by the way, now remember, Chubby, Chubby Checker, it looks like he settled out of court and he was asking for half a million dollars. This is how well this app did. Some estimates showed that the app had been downloaded only 84 times at the cost of 99 cents each time. So, but the news story is priceless. But the thing uh, that a uh, couple of things about when I saw the Chubby Checker suing the Chubby Checker, it reminded me of a thing they used to have out there called Captain Pecker, the party wrecker, which my friend little Jimmy Satan found in the early 90s. And the original uh, cover for Captain Pecker, Captain Pecker was a giant inflatable penis. And it showed this guy punching this while laughing maniacally. And his buddy in the background is like grinning maniacally and his wife standing there like this. But if you look up Captain Pecker, the party wrecker, well, first of all, people are going to wonder what you're looking up. But if you look it up now, um, it's actually now for bachelorette parties. So the, the drawing is of women like riding Captain Pecker, the party wrecker. So, yay, progress, I guess. I don't know. Um, and the other thing this reminded me of, and I've been waiting for about 50 years, maybe a little bit more to talk about this. In the Schoolhouse Rock nouns one, Chubby Checker is shown as being white. They go, Chubby Checker, he was doing the twist and the Beatles and the monkeys. And it sounds like this, but yeah, they have like a white Chubby Checker. So long before Marvel was whitewashing characters, this was done on with Chubby Checker on Schoolhouse Rock. All right, up next, it's the Raskins versus Motley Crue. Who the hell are the Raskins, you're asking? Well, the Raskins are Logan and Roger Raskin. They front a band. Uh, they paid in 2014, I think it was, they paid Motley Crue $1 million to open for them on their tour. That's right. They gave Motley Crue money so that they can open for them. Um, and they it didn't go well. They didn't think they got their billion dollars worth. So here are some of the things that they're alleging happened. Now, I don't know what eventually happened with this lawsuit. If it got thrown out or settled out of court, I can't find out. But here we go. They're claiming that Motley Crue team members, crew members, punched members of the Raskins. They also claim they ran into them with heavy equipment. They destroyed the van, the band, that's the Raskins, their van's engine by jamming a metal rod through the engine fan, thus causing it to explode. And then my personal favorite, they claim that Motley Crew members uh, or, or crew members of Motley Crew, when you're saying crew twice, it gets confusing, uh, ran on stage wearing monkey masks during a performance in Darien, Connecticut, and they showered the band with water guns that were filled with urine, like super soakers filled with urine. So yeah, I think I think in this case, though, I'm still, I'm siding, I side with Chubby Checker on the first one. I'm siding with Motley Crew on this one. So I get the feeling... <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, it, it is the first really metal thing that the crew have done. And then my final one here is 
audience member versus the all American rejects. Now, if you've ever heard of the never heard of the all American rejects, they are a punk band so bad that we will probably find ourselves playing a festival with them somewhere this summer in, in the <laughs> South. Them, them smash mouth and the spin doctors. Um, so they managed to get a sponsorship from Monster Energy Drinks, from the Monster Beverage Company. Obviously not from the La Large Hadron Super Collider, because you're going to find out they're not doing some of the brightest things uh, imaginable. So they go, this is on the 2010 Vans World Tour, which had a lot of other stuff about it. But the band's frontman, who is named Tyson Ritter, which is one of the whitest names I've ever heard in my life, decided to throw cans of Monster Energy into the audience. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. So um, he did hit a fan in the head. I'm not giving her name. We, we have our picture up and we were showing went from our wonderful graphics department showing the things for the lawsuits. Uh, he did hit her in the head. She, she got a laceration. She needed 12 stitches and it did leave a permanent scar. But the, here's my favorite. The lawsuit stated that she did not reasonably expect the large drink to be thrown at her at the time and could not avoid being hit by the can thrown by Ritter. So I'm just glad these guys didn't have a t-shirt cannon. That would have been really good, just gunning them down. So yeah, so those are my those are my three favorite lawsuits, rock and roll lawsuits that I'm beginning with. I skipped over a lot of people suing people claiming that they caused their kids to shoot themselves, which would have been fun too, but uh, um, we can go into that some other time. Joe, I think you're next. Yes. First, I'd like to discuss Ohio police officers sue Afro man for making fun of them in a music video. <laughs> and I think this lawsuit just was came out last year and I think it's still in progress. So <laughs> A Afro man, in case you don't know, is the guy who had the hit with, um, because I got high back in 2000 or 2001 around there and uh, crazy rap. And he put out a, he's been making albums since then. And um, well, while he was on tour in 2022, in August, the police raided his home in Ohio, in somewhere in Adams County, Ohio. And the warrant was for narcotics and kidnapping. And he has, he, they dropped the charges. They couldn't find anything, any evidence of anything at all. That the uh, <laughs> but wait, 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 we're skipping over something kidnapping. <laughs> That's exactly right, kidnapping, and and <laughs> wait, he wasn't home, but his uh, ex wife and children lived nearby, and they noticed the police presence, so they went there and started filming through the window, I think, through the window. Uh, plus he has security camera footage of this. Also, he has security camera footage of the police disconnecting the security camera. And they took about, uh, five, five grand from him. And he claims they only, they shorted him four hundred dollars but the police claim that it's just a bookkeeping error. <laughs> they counted wrong the first time. Oh, whoopsie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whoopsie. <laughs> and <laughs> well, anyway, he gets home. And eventually decides he's angry, but he write, decides to write an album <laughs> mostly about this thing. It's called Lemon Pound Cake. And he even has security footage of one of the sheriff putting his gun down on the counter. And there's Lemon Pound Cake and getting himself a slice of Lemon Pound Cake. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the footage that he has from his security camera before it got turned off. <laughs> and, and he made two... Two, two music videos for this album using uh, security footage and footage that I guess is x way uh, also made. Um, and that's what they're suing him over because they're funny. I guess they're suing him over the song, especially on Pound Cake. Um, and there's another one called Will You... Who's Gonna... Uh, oh, will you help me repair my door? Because they busted his door down and his gate as well. <laughs> so will you help me repair my door? <laughs> um so I I sided with Afro Man in this case. 
I think everybody should now make a, a you know, a, a song, at least write one song making fun of the cops in that town. I'm, I'm so glad you brought this to my attention, Joe. I had no idea this existed, and I think I'm a better man for knowing about it. I should it. say that um, my boyfriend plays the, because I got high, I mean, he played that for, that's one of his songs he plays a lot. So I also, I already knew about Afferman, and then when this happened, uh, <laughs> and he came out with this lemon pound cake album and i i said that's that's an interesting thing because i found out that the the uh yeah that the police are I, I knew i knew about him because blues clues used to always end with that because i got high song <laughs> oh yeah okay yeah it's it's it, it's ubiquitous i guess that I just good. one more it's um the dead kennedys sue jello biafra over royalties slash control of catalog and this happened, I think, in 99 or 2000 or whatever. I what I, They may have sued him, but the, the, law, the, the case was tried in the year 2000. Um, the Dead Kennedys were, Jelly Biafra was no longer part of the Dead Kennedys. Uh, they actually broke up for a while, and then the other Dead Kennedys that weren't other than Joe Biafra they were actually suing for control of their their catalog, but also I think they wanted to use a song, Holiday in Cambodia, in... A holiday uh, in Cambodia. Permission it was a Vol use it for a Le was Levi's commercial. Oh, I thought it was a Volkswagen commercial. Okay, yeah. It was for a Levi's commercial. And Levi's, at one time, was counterculture, and I guess they wanted to get a hold of that counterculture again with this song. But it it seems ridiculous. It seems ridiculous to me. But the the um they were also suing over royalties, and there was what Jello called a bookkeeping error. Who knows if it would really Ohio cost. <laughs> but the thing <laughs> in which he didn't increase the royalties when he increased the price of the records, because he he was the record company and someone else. East Bay Ray also originally was also owned alternative tentacles with jello but later severed so by this point he was only jello was on the record company side so that's why they're suing jello and i was surprised when i read about this case that maybe i shouldn't have been that there was no actual contracts it was all a handshake deal so the jury uh ruled in favor of the dead kennedys and not in favor of jello and I think uh, heavily weighing for that was the fact that it, the the evidence, other than he said he said, was that the royalties clearly weren't being distributed as the as per uh, agreement. But they got control of the catalog, and they could use. They also got uh, uh, change some of the ways that they they weren't getting credit for songs that they had written, and they wanted credit, so they got that too. Yeah, the trial was going to be postponed, but then the jury found that there was always time for Jello. Hey, uh, have you checked out uh, RFK Jr. speaking of Dead Kennedys? RFK Jr.'s new song, Too Drunk to Fart. It's really <laughs> yeah. it's but, That headline was just amazing. I, mean, I love that so much. <laughs> uh, let's see, is it mine or Dan? It's Dan, uh, because you went last week. <clears throat> um... The first one I chose was um, a lawsuit against George Harrison in, I think it was 1981, I think. And it was from his, his song, My Sweet Lord, which came out in 1970. Um, and it was, uh, I think Alan Klein was the guy that sued him. And he was actually... A, former manager of the Beatles but he also owned um the rights to the song he's so fine by the chiffons and you know we'll have links to the songs it's it's crazy how similar they actually sound to each other um but one of my favorite things about it or maybe my favorite thing about it is I heard about this years ago, and this is where I first heard the term cryptomnesia, which is a phenomenon where somebody will 
write something. Um, and basically like forget that they had heard the so a song similar or like they didn't, <clears throat> there was no motivation to copy it. It's just maybe was in their subconscious because there's no, there's no way George Harrison didn't hear that song. You know, it was like a hit. Um, so, and he, you know, he claimed that he was not intentionally ripping it off. Um, but I think it's, I think it's an interesting phenomenon too, because I feel like comedians probably do it too, where somebody comes up with a joke and then they say, it and everybody's like, oh, we've already heard so-and-so say that. But I mean, I think that happens to people all the time. I mean, every, everybody probably has an experience where they think they have an original thought and well, you know, Mick Jagger had ripped off that Katie Lang song, and and Keith Richards said that Mick Jagger has has written so many songs that if he hears a song, he just assumes he wrote it. He wasn't being <laughs> sarcastic; he was just saying he just assumed, "Oh, well, I didn't write that." Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, I just thought that was a an interesting thing. Um. Did you ever hear the Chiffons actually did a cover that did their version? He's so fine. Put out a version of that with after the lawsuit with My Sweet Lord into it. So they're singing oh. He's so, and then they go into My Sweet Lord. Yeah, cool. I did not know that. Um, <clears throat> the other one I chose was has to do with Mark Farner of Grand Funk Railroad, not the dog that the Butthole Surfers had, but <laughs> the actual Mark Farner of Grand Funk Railroad. Um, <clears throat> I guess he he left the band to 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 do solo work and when he started touring he he was calling it Mark Farner's American Band but Grand Funk Railroad claims that they're the American Band so they they I have to read this because it was so complicated sounding when I was reading it um they filed an injunction this was in 2004 it said farner violated the injunction which called for among other things that farner's first and last names appear in capital letters before <laughs> a reference to grand funk railroad <laughs> or grand funk or grand funk railroad <clears throat> with only the first letters of the band capitalized and first letters of the words former formerly and member also capitalized <laughs> Uh, and then it says currently and in open defiance of this <laughs> permanent injunction Farner has undertaken a concert tour series promoting himself as Grand Funk Railroad and the American Band with oh without plaintiff's permission the marks Grand Funk Railroad and the American Band and it's all in capital letters um it just goes on it's also it's the song says we're an American band not we're the American band. We're Mark Farner's <laughs> American band. <laughs> we no. should cover the we're Mark Farner's American band. I just My sweet good. Lord, we're Mark Farner's American band. <laughs> I thought it was the pettiest thing ever. And, you know, I, I, it's funny because sometimes promoters take their own liberties with how they promote a band. Like when, like Joe and I were, you know, when we did like Danjo stuff, people would be like the Dead Milkman, and it's like we actually had specifically asked at times not to like have that. I, I asked them not to put it near my name or have it because they'll do they'll put tiny, you know, tiny in tiny letters. You need a magnifying glass for Rodney Thomas of and then of the Dead Milkman in big print. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I always wanted to start a band called X Members of X Members of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always, I just always find it funny when there's interband turmoil over like petty stuff, too. I love that. I, I love hope it. We never do that. <laughs> Dan, you took the last piece of pizza last Friday. I'm a little <laughs> pissed about that. No, somebody no one had ever seen before took the last piece. Of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who wandered in. Yeah. So yeah, that's it for me. I only did two. Oh, I gotta let the cat in. Who let the cat in? Meow, 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 meow. All right, well, he lets the cat in. Okay, so my lawsuit is Who Are You Gonna Call I Want a New Drug by Hugh Lewis in the News. Of course, that song, but Ray Parker Jr. wrote the song Ghostbusters. And in 1984, there was a lawsuit 
Um, the producers of the film Ghostbusters originally had approached Huey Lewis to write the film's theme song, but he had already committed to doing work on a theme song for another sci-fi comedy, Back to the Future. And so he said, I can't do it. And so the producers um, decided to, to uh, ask Ray Parker Jr. Uh, to write a song. And apparently they directed him to write a song that was described as Huey Lewis-esque. And Mr. Lewis himself certainly thought so. He filed suit against Parker, alleging that he lifted the melody from his song, I Want a New Drug. So what happened was the pair ended up settling out of court in 1995 on the condition that both parties refrain from speaking about the suit in public. But uh, Mr. Lewis apparently uh, forgot about that agreement and he unloaded about the settlement on a 2001 episode of VH1's Behind the Music. Um, and then Parker sued him soon after for breaching the confidentiality agreement. Um, I actually don't know where, where that ended up, but maybe they agreed to shake hands and just walk away from that. But anyway, that's my, I only have one. That is my sole rock and roll lawsuit. Have you ever seen the Key and Peele sketch where they have Ray Parker Jr.'s other songs? We, I, I'll find a link to it. It is it is a, a high note in comedy. They have Ray Parker Jr.'s like, I've done these all weird ass. Like, I've done some other songs for movies. You might not have you know heard these songs. And it's like a Fifty Shades of Grey. And it's so weird. <laughs> it is the, and, it's, and they're playing Ray Parker Jr. It's like a man, man. It is abs It is like, like, you know, just about every Key and Peele sketch is, is, is perfect, but this one is amazing. So. Okay. All right. All right, folks, it's time for recommendations, and it's a new segment for my recommendations I like to call Make It Witchy. So we played Laurel Hill Cemetery uh, last Friday night, and want to thank everybody who was there. Um, we just got some pictures in today, and, and it was a really good time, and uh, um, the sound was fantastic. Uh, the opening band, the I don't see the opening band, they shared a bill. We don't like to say opening band. Uh, we shared a bill with the Ire. The Ire were amazing. Every, everything just went around really good, but we thought it was going to get rained out. We were, we all the forecast said, <coughs> excuse me, rain. So a few nights before, I sent an email out to Orly Stewart, uh, who is a witch who lives in New Orleans, uh, who I know from another project I'm in. And I said, Orly, we, we like a protection from rain spell. And Orly said, never done anything like that, but I can give it a try. And she sent back this uh, sigil that she got out of a... Um, like a 15th century French grimoire. And then we had that on our set list. We had it on my laptop. We had it everywhere. And we got like 10 minutes worth of spritz when we were setting up and we just threw some tarps over, tarps over stuff. But then we were totally fine. So I'd like to thank Orly Stewart for the spell. And uh, um, folks, please go visit and subscribe to her uh, YouTube channel. And if you have any witch needs, contact her. Um, now, for witchy mu music, the Bestial Mouths have a new single out, which is called Slit Skin. It's on their Rot album, Rot in My Skin. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm bewitched and choking, um, which is really, really good. Uh, Brent Showers from uh, Damon and also from Solve, he worked on it. So I heavily recommend that. Oh, by the way, going back to the Orly thing, we scientifically proved that witchcraft is real, uh, thus completing the work of Jack Parsons. And finally, if you need even more witchy music, there's my radio show uh, for this uh, finish up last month or this month or whatever. Um, and we finished up the trip, the trek across America, ending up at a Hornet picnic table uh, out in L.A. So those are, are my recommendations for this week. I'm going to go choke on water some more. I'd like to recommend Afro Man's Lemon Pound Cake album, and especially the videos uh, that I mentioned before. And also, stay, I recommend stay cool when you can in this heat and don't exert yourself, especially if you're my age. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, I would like to recommend pineapple juice. Mm. I'm not going to mention a specific brand but it is nice that it's in this little thin can um you have to shake it up and 
drink it. And, you know, like Joe said, it's really hot out and we should be drinking water. We should be hydrating. But this is a nice, like, fruity beverage. Um, and it's healthy for you, too. It's 100% pineapple juice. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is when it's empty, it still feels like there's more juice in it. <laughs> That's it. Um, just in time for the release of Oppenheimer, a company called Nervous Squirrel has released a Eurorack module that generates random control voltages, uh, gates, and triggers from uranium ore. I couldn't believe it when I saw this thing. So it's a Eurorack module that you put in your system. I don't have any Eurorack, but I follow the trades, as they say. Um, they have a glass jar with uranium ore mounted on the front of this thing, and that behind it is a Geiger counter, okay? And the Geiger, Geiger counter detects the ionizing radiation that's coming from this ore, and the timings of the radioactive events are mapped to control voltages, um, and they can you can assign these to various gates and triggers. So you can, like, connect this to your other oscillators and things and tell them to fire off randomly based on the decay of this re, uh, uranium ore. Um, I thought it was pretty uh, clever and insightful. And I was also shocked that you could buy a device filled with uranium ore <laughs> in this day and age. They, they um, used to make chemistry sets for know, atomic uh, an sets, atomic yeah. chem or uh, an atomic adventure experiment kit back in the day. I'm pretty sure I can come up with a photo of that. Um, but I, uh, it's called Orsum Volts, and uh, we'll provide a link and a picture of it. It's it's pretty incredible. So that made me think, it's like, can I actually go out and buy some uranium ore? And yes, you can. You can go to Amazon and buy uranium ore. Um, and they sell it as a scientific tool to test your Geiger counter. So you can buy a little tin of it, um, and you can, you can use it to test your Geiger counter to, to adjust the accuracy of your your Geiger counter. It comes with a, a a a code on it that says, you know, it emits at this rate, blah, blah, blah. And then you can set your Geiger counter so it's more accurate. Anyway, that's my recommendation for today. Some Check out the or some volts. Some uh, smart ass oh, some smart ass in the comments on Syntopia pointed out that uranium has a half-life of two million years. So in four million years that that thing's not going to work. It's not. <laughs> you just get some water from Amazon module. and fill it up again. Yeah. But what I did was the uh, um, last podcast on the left has just been doing the Manhattan Project. So I sent them a link of that. I'm like, by the way, because you know they've been talking about you know how people you know were making the uranium piles and and the use of uranium and all, all they had to go through to get it. And here it is in a Eurorack module. So. All right, that's uh, um. Does anybody have anything, any, any, any old business new, I'm gaveling out with a cat, any old <laughs> business or new business before we end this law firm meeting for tonight? <laughs> Case closed. Case closed. All right. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. R.I.P. Tony. Good night. <laughs>